Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to our next session. This is uh, session number eight of Qadi Iyad Kitab al-Shifa. Part one, chapter two. This is the middle of section 12. And this is um, section 12, which is called the Hilm, the Ihtimal, and the Afwa of the Prophet وسلم, the forbearance, the long suffering, and the pardon. <clears throat> Started that last time. So we are um, on page, in my translation here, which again is an older edition, uh, this is um, page 55. Um, so right it towards the bottom here. When a man said to the Prophet ﷺ, act fairly. So this is a hadith. There's multiple versions of this hadith in Muslim and Bukhari and Bayhaqi. When a man comes to the Prophet ﷺ, and according to the commentators, this is um, after the Battle of Hunayn. <clears throat> And he said to the Prophet Sallallahu So be just, for indeed you are not just. Or in another version of the hadith, act fairly. This is, the, this is a division by which the face of God is not desired. And then Qadi Iyad, he mentions here, the Prophet did not go further than making it clear to him how ignorant he was, admonishing and reminding him of what he had said to him. And then the Prophet said to him, uh, Like, woe unto you, or confound you. Who will be just if I am not just? <clears throat> and <clears throat> I would fail and be lost if I did not act fairly. Then he restrained one of his companions who wanted to attack this man because the man's hypocrisy uh, had been manifested. So this man and his companions, um, well, the, the, one of the versions of the hadith continues with the Prophet Sallallahu He said, this man and his companions, they recite the Qur'an, but it does not go past their throats. Right? So many of the ulama say here that the Prophet Sallallahu is prophesizing the khawarij, the karajites. Some of the commentators also mention that this man actually would, be, would join the khawarij of course, the Khawarij, as we know, was the first sectarian in the history of uh, Islam. The Khawarij were uh, very exclusivist. They were takfiris. Um, <clears throat> they considered anyone who did not believe exactly as they believed to be kuffar. And not only that, they would consider them to be um, uh, you know, apostates. So they would, they would kill them and they would take their possessions. Oftentimes, they would even kill their families. So the hadith is here teaching us about um, the Prophet Sallallahu forbearance, even uh, under such circumstances where there's, there's outright disrespect of him in public in front of the other companions. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he says he did not go further than making it clear to him how ignorant he was, admonishing and reminding him. <clears throat> okay, so that's... Um, And then he continues, Ghawrath ibn al-Harith, uh, while he says, whilst he and some of the other people were talking about the raid of that al-Riqa' undertook to assassinate the Messenger of Allah. He found him sitting alone under a tree. So the Prophet Sallallahu did not stop until he was standing over him. The Prophet did not stop him until he was standing over him with an unsheathed sword in his hand. So this man is able to um, enter into the Muslim camp and he has a sword in his hand and he walks up to the Prophet وسلم, directly up to him. Uh, the Prophet here, according to this version of the Hadith, the Prophet sees him the whole time, did not stop him. He walks right up to, up to him and the man says to the Prophet Do you, Are you afraid of me? Do you fear me? And the Prophet said, La, no. And then the man said, Man yamna'uka minni. So who's going to protect you from me? And the Prophet said, Allah. Of 
course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Wallahu yasi muka minan nas, that God will protect you from the people. And then he continues, the sword fell from his hand, and the Prophet grabbed it and said to him, Waman yam ni'uka minni, and who is going to protect you from me? And then the man said, Punish in the best manner. And so the Prophet left him and pardoned him. So this is clearly an attempted assassination, an attempted attempt, an attempted uh, attempt on the life of the Prophet ﷺ, attempted murder of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ, he pardoned him. And he came to his people. This man eventually came to his people. And he said, I've come to you. Uh, I have come to you from the best of people. And this uh, hadith is in uh, Bukhari and Muslim. One of the major reports about his pardoning and his pardoning the Jewess was his pardoning of the Jewess who had poisoned him with the sheep after she had confessed to the poisoning. This hadith is um, mentioned uh, also in Muslim, I believe. So there was a Jewess of Bani Nadir <clears throat> who had uh, poisoned a sheep and offered and invited some of the companions, including the Prophet ﷺ. And uh, he, uh, the Prophet ate some, and another companion did, named Bishr. Uh, Al-Bara uh, Al ibn Bishr, I believe was his name, and uh, Al-Bara died from it. The Prophet ﷺ, um, he, uh, he said that the meat is telling me that it's been poisoned. And then according to Qadi Ayyad, he pardoned her. <clears throat> Qadi Ayyad then mentions that he did not punish Labid, uh, who was... Um, apparently a, a black magician or sorcerer of some sort who used magic sihr against him, although he was informed about it, and it was revealed to him with an explanation of what had happened. This is disputed um, because it seems to uh, contradict a verse in the Quran, Wallahu ya'asimuka minan nas, the verse I quoted earlier, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you from humanity. But the people of Sirah, they mention this story of the bead. Allahu alam. Qadi Iyad, he mentions, nor did he punish Abdullah ibn Ubay and other hypocrites in spite of the seriousness of what they had done and said about him. And his wife, Aisha. So Abdullah ibn Ubay was one of those who started the, the ifk, the lie or the buhtan, the slander, the calumny against our mother Aisha, radiallahu ta'ala anha, radiallahu ta'ala anha. Uh, on the contrary, he said to the person who indicated uh, that one of them uh, should be killed, he said, no, let it not be said that Muhammad kills his companions. Right, so even though those were munafiqun, right, um, and, and they were munafiqun in, in, in the real sense of the word, right, they, they, they were pretending outright to be Muslims. Um, you know, you have, there's an element of, of nifaq or hypocrisy uh, among uh, among Muslims in general, but they're not they're not absolute munafiqeen. Um, but these Abdullah ibn Ubay and his and his cohort, uh, these are literally fake Muslims. But the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did not want people to think that he was he was killing believers or killing people or killing his companions. People would not believe the Muslims if they said, "Well, these these are munafiqeen; these are infiltrators." Um, these are people who are trying to corrupt the ummah from within. These are people who are sowing seeds of sedition and treason and so on and so forth. It doesn't, the optics don't look good if, if you were to do that. Um, so it's important to, uh, to um, not do that. Anna said, I was with the Prophet wasallam when he was wearing a thick cloak. Of course, this is the famous story. A Bedouin came, uh, pulled him so violently by the edge of the cloak it made a mark on the side of his neck. So there was a, an inflammation on the side of the neck of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's a hadith that says, Man, man sakan al-bada, man sakan al-badiya jafa. That whoever, whoever dwells in the desert or lives in the desert becomes a little bit rough or gruff. Right? So this Bedouin, they're, they're a little rough. And he came in and he, he grabbed the cloak. Um, the border of the cloak of the Prophet ﷺ and pulled him very violently. And, uh, and Anas said, we can see inflammation on his neck. 
Then he said, Muhammad, uh, let me load up these two camels of mine with the property of Allah that you have in your possession. Ya Muhammad murli min malillahi ladhi attack. Uh, and the Prophet was silent, and then he said, the property is a property of Allah, and I am his slave. Then he said, shall I, shall I take retaliation from you, O Bedouin, for, for what you have done to me? And he said, no. Um, and the Prophet said, why not? And the Bedouin said, because you do not pay back an evil action with an evil action, or you don't pay back an evil with, for, uh, an evil with an evil. And this is a great Quranic imperative, right? The famous ayah in the Quran, chapter 41, verse 34, uh, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, <clears throat> وَلَا تَسْتُوا الْحَسَنَاتُ وَلَا سَيِّئَةَ Good and evil are not the same. اِدْفَعَ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنَ Repel evil with something better. فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةٌ كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌ حَمِيمٌ And then you will see the one between him and you with enmity become as it were thy intimate companion. So don't repay evil with an evil or bad action uh, with a bad action. And the Prophet laughed and ordered that one camel be loaded up with barley and the other camel with dates. And the hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. So two camels, uh, the equivalent of that today is like two pickup trucks full of food. Right? <clears throat> Aisha said, I never saw the Prophet ﷺ ever take revenge for an injustice done to him as long as it was not regarding one of the orders of Allah which must be respected. He never struck anyone with his hand at all except when doing jihad in the way of Allah. He never hit a woman or a servant, Bukhari and Muslim. Of course, jihad here is in the context of, of, a, uh, of a military um, exposition, uh, expedition. <clears throat> that is obviously called by the head of state, and that is the Prophet ﷺ, or the the head of a Muslim state. It's not vigilante justice or any faction or group that decides to to declare a type of jihad. And and Ali said something similar to this as well, but it's coming from the wife of the Prophet ﷺ. Nam yadrib Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi shay'an qat illa an yujahida fi sabilillah. Um, that the Prophet did not strike anything with his hand uh, except in uh, a, a military expedition or a, a battle. Mm -hmm. And Ibn Taymiyyah said, if, even if you look at all the battles of the Prophet وسلم, all of them have a defensive component to them, a defensive component to them. And then Aisha continues, and she's specific, he did not hit a ghulam, he did not hit an imra'ah, a a um, a servant or a child. He did not hit a woman. <clears throat> a man was brought to him, and he was told this man wanted to kill you. So, continuing with the Kitab al-Shifa, the Prophet said, "Have no fear. Even though you wanted to do this, you would not have uh, been given power over me." This hadith is in Tabarani, Imam Ahmad. Next here, uh, Qadi Iyad. He mentions the story of um, a Madani Jew named Zayd ibn Sa'na, who came to him demanding, came to the Prophet demanding that the Prophet repay him a debt. And he pulled his uh, garment from his shoulder, seized hold of him, and behaved very coarsely with the Prophet. And he said, uh, Banu Muttalib, you, you are procrastinating. And, and Umar was able to chase him off. And Umar spoke very harshly with him. The Prophet merely smiled. Then the Prophet said, Umar, he, had need, he and I needed something else from you. Command me to repay well and command him to ask for his debt well. Right? And then he said, I still owe him three. And Umar commanded that he be paid. And he added uh, 20 sa'a like 20 handfuls of barley, more since he had alarmed him or scared him. And that, according to Zaid's explanation, was the reason for him becoming Muslim. So Zaid later, he said that there were only two remaining signs of prophethood, which I had not yet recognized in the Prophet wasallam or noticed. Forbearance, overcoming quick temperedness, and extreme ignorance, only increasing him in forbearance. 
So he said, I tested him for these and I found him as described. So in other words, the Prophet ﷺ became angry very, very slowly, but when he did become angry, it was very tempered and then it left him very quickly. And so those, those were the signs that, that this Madani Jew was, was looking for before he can accept the Prophet ﷺ as the Prophet. Qadi well, Iyad, he goes on to say that the hadiths about his forbearance, patience, and pardon, uh, um, in spite of having power to punish, are too many to present. Those we have mentioned should be sufficient. They can be found in the Sahih collections and other reliable books transmitted by many paths of transmission. They deal with his patience in the face of Quraysh's harshness and the injury done to him in the Jahiliyyah and his endurance of great hardship, hardships at the hands of the Quraysh until Allah let him conquer them and gave him power over them. They did not doubt that they would be wiped out and their wealthy men killed, but he kept on pardoning and overlooking. Uh, he said, what do you say I have done to you? So now he's talking here about, and we've talked about this uh, a few times in the past, the conquest of Mecca, the Fatha Mecca, when the Prophet ﷺ comes in, back into Mecca, uh, from Medina after he was forced um, to make hijrah and the Quraysh kept uh, giving him no peace, multiple attacks, or raids on the oasis of Medina. The, the, um, the Quraysh had joined forces with the Bedouin tribes in the Najd. They were in uh, cahoots, as it were, with uh, the Munafiqeen uh, in Medina itself, as well as some elements of the Bani Israel the Jewish tribes that were in Medina. So uh, eight, nine years of, of uh, actively trying to basically eradicate the entire um, Muslim community in Medina. So the Prophet wasallam he eventually marches on Mecca, as we know, and he says to them, what do you think I should do to you? And they said, you're a good, generous brother and a good nephew. And he said, I will say, as my brother Yusuf said, La tathriba alaykum al yawm, yaghfir Allahu lakum. That, so here the Prophet ﷺ is quoting from the Quran. This is the statement in the Quran attributed to Yusuf ﷺ. When Yusuf ﷺ, obviously we know his story, when he was um, thrown into the well by his brothers, um, his ten brothers really, uh, and uh, he was taken as a slave into Egypt, and then he eventually became uh, the vizier of the pharaoh, um, the minister of agriculture, according to some. And then, uh, and then his brothers come into Egypt from Canaan because there was a famine in Canaan. And then um, when he identifies himself, uh, he says to them, La alaykum al -yum. This, this day there is no blemish upon you. No reproach will be upon you. God has forgiven you. So the Prophet wasallam he, he quotes this verse, which is in Surah Yusuf, ayah number 92, um, to the Quraysh during the conquest of Mecca. He says, go and you are free. And then he mentions here, Anas ibn Malik, he said that eight men from Tan'im, came to the dawn prayer with the intention of, of killing the Prophet ﷺ. They were seized and the Prophet set them free. And Allah revealed, That this is the Sababun Nuzul of the Ayah, chapter 48, verse 24. He is the one who restrained their hands from you. This hadith is in Muslim Abu Dawood and Tirmidhi and others. When Abu Sufyan was brought to him after he had brought the Confederates, against him, killed his uncle and companions, and made a punitive example of them, the Prophet forgave him and was gentle to him. He said, confound you, Abu Sufyan, isn't it high time that you knew that there is no God but Allah? And then Abu Sufyan said, my father and mother be your ransom, how forbearing and generous you are, maintaining ties of kinship. So the Prophet ﷺ did not give up on Abu Sufyan ibn Harb. And Abu Sufyan, remember, is the leader of the Meccans, and he uh, was the, uh, the, the leader of many um, military uh, campaigns against the Sahaba, against the Prophet Wasallam, against Medina. And the point here that Qadi Iyad is making 
is that uh, even towards even after years and years of of attempting to kill the Prophet Sallallahu and killing many companions and many members of Ahlul Bayt, the Prophet Sallallahu he still spoke to him in a way that was um, respectful, invited him to the faith, and this very much surprised Abu Sufyan, um, and eventually uh, he did become uh, Muslim. And then he says here, the Messenger of Allah was the slowest person to anger, and the easiest to please. So that's the end of section 12. Now section 13, and these sections don't need a lot of um, a lot of commentary. I think what Qadi Iyad mentions here really speaks for itself. So section 13, his generosity and liberality. As for generosity, benevolence, magnanimity, and liberality, they too have different meanings. Some people divide them into different branches. They say that benevolence or karam is to spend cheerfully and what is important and useful. They also call it courage and the opposite of baseness. Liberality is to forego what one is owed by others cheerfully, so forgoing a debt. It is the opposite of ill nature and magnanimity is to spend easily and to avoid acquisition of what is not praised. And it's the opposite of tight-fistedness. So he says here, the Prophet had no equal in these noble qualities, and no one exceeded him in them. All who knew him would describe him so. Ibn al-Munqadir heard Jabir ibn Abdullah say, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was not asked for anything to which he said no or la. And Anas ibn Malik and Sahal ibn Sa'ad made similar reports. It's mentioned in Bukhari. Anas ibn Malik, he said that the only time I heard the Prophet say la was when he was saying la ilaha illallah. Ibn Abbas said the Prophet وسلم, was the most generous of people in giving gifts and the most generous of all in the month of Ramadan when he met Jibril alayhi salam. He was more generous than even the wind which is sent forth. That's a famous hadith you'll find in many books uh, of hadith, but it comes from Bukhari and Muslim. Anna said that a man asked him for something, and he gave him all the sheep between two mountains. The man returned to his people and said, Become Muslim. Muhammad gives the, uh, gives the gift of a man who does not fear poverty. I think there's a problem here. There we go. I'm sorry about this lighting today. It's a little strange. We're probably going to end a little bit early this session. We'll probably just go another five minutes because I'm having some technical difficulties here. <clears throat> he continues. Let's see. He gave a hundred camels to more than one person. He gave Safwan a hundred, then a hundred, and then a hundred. This had been his character since before he was entrusted with the message. Waraka bin Nofal told him, you bear all and attain to what others are denied. So this was the attitude, <clears throat> the character, the, the khuluq of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi even before uh, the, the message has descended upon him. This is just how he was created as a generous person. He returned the captives of Hawazin, who numbered 6,000. <clears> he gave al Abbas so much gold that he could not carry it. 90,000 dirhams were brought to him, and he placed them on a mat, and then got up and distributed them. He did not turn away anyone who asked him until he had given them all away. <clears throat> a man came and asked him for something. The prophet said, I do not have anything, but buy something on my account, and when I get the money, I will pay for it. So this hadith is in Tirmidhi. And Umar said, Allah has not obliged you to do what you're not able to do. The Prophet disliked that. So the man of the Ansar said, Messenger of Allah, spend and do not fear a lessening from the master of the throne. The Prophet smiled and the pleasure could be seen in his face. He said, I am commanded to this. <clears throat> it, is mentioned by, uh, it was mentioned that Mu'awwid ibn Afra said, I brought the Prophet, peace be upon him, a plate of fresh dates and cucumber and he gave me a handful of jewelry and gold. So that's the end of, basically that's the end of section 13. So I think I'm going to stop at this point. 
because there's, like I said, we're having some technical difficulties here. And um, uh, I'd like to do sections, probably finish the, the chapter next time, inshallah. So we have three sessions left. No, we have two sessions left, session nine and session 10. So we will return, inshallah, next week, Wednesday at 8, and we'll make a push to finish um, chapter 2 by the end of the 10th, the 10th session, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.